Well, praise God. Thank everyone for coming. Tonight we're doing another teaching on our healing class. Um, the premise is a little bit on getting the Bride of Christ ready and uh, getting rid of Jezebel to do that. So we're going to touch on that. If you've listened to anything lately, well, let me start with prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, I do just thank you for this day, Lord, for the people that you've brought, Lord God. I pray that we can speak into their lives what, what is going on and what you want us to do, Lord God. We are seeking you, Lord, with all our heart. We're asking you, Lord, to take us to a place we've never been before. We want to go higher. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So if you've paid any attention to what's going on out there, you've probably heard about the date, September 23rd, 2017. Um, and there's a lot of speculation what that is going to be. And as it pertains to the prophecy that we find in Revelation chapter 12. And that's the days that, that we're finding ourselves in. Um, if you want to put that, that picture up there, I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 12 so you get an idea of, of what I'm talking about. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she being with, tri with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. For devour the child as soon as she was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. You might want to remember that. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice you heavens and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And of the sea, for the devils come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. I've always prayed when I read that scripture that that, that is indeed symbolic of the United States. Um, some people say that we're annihilated. I said, I hope that we get it right and we're a friend of Israel and we assist. And that she might fly into the wilderness and to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a times from the face of the servant. So there we are again, th those same periods of time. So there's been lots of speculation of, is this the rapture of the church? Um, we had... We had the blood moons in 2015. Uh, we're having a solar eclipse next month. And we have uh, a date, September 23rd, 2017. And, and where this gets significant 
is actually back September 23rd, 2015. What happened on that day, as confirmed by NASA and astronomers, was that the Bethlehem star appeared in the heavens. It hadn't appeared since we know since the birth of Christ 2,000 years ago. And prior to that, it was 2,000 years before that, in the day of Abraham, that that same star was seen. So way back in 2015, it was brought up. Maybe this could, this could be something here. But nothing necessarily happened. And then we get to 2017. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but remember the stars and the moon and the sun, and, and all these are for signs for us to see. So this Bethlehem star shows up again. 2,000 years ago it showed up. And if you remember, the wise man came up to Herod, and Herod said, hey, uh, when did you see this? Now, the, the, the shepherds in the field were there at Jesus' birth. The wise man didn't see Herod, we, we would presume, to two years later. Because at that point, Herod then went out and killed everybody, two years and younger. That's where you see in the Bible, Rachel weeping for her children are no more. Because the wise men had said, yes, we saw this sign two years ago in Bethlehem. And to eliminate his competition of a new king, Herod had everyone killed. And so after the sign of Jesus, there was persecution. Here we are in 2017. Not only did we have that star in 2015, but we're two years later, the same pattern, but we have something else going on. So as we read, there is this woman, and, and she's about to deliver a birth. What has taken place right now on September 23rd, 2017, has never happened as far as man has recorded history. This event has never happened to fulfill this, pro this prophecy. This is a picture, the best I could find, that there's of the constellation Virgo. That is the woman. Leo's here on top of her. So what the prophecy said was that And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. So right now what's happened on this date, up here, if, you could, if we'd be able to see in the stars, is the sun at her head. Down at her feet on this date is the moon. That's not necessarily altogether all that uncommon, but it is a little bit. But that has taken place. And what is happening is Jupiter is out here as it's going through the constellations. What is unique is Jupiter enters into Virgo. And Jupiter has been circling in Virgo for about nine to nine and a half months. And instead of going through the constellations like its normal path, astronomers say that then, then Jupiter is leaving Virgo. It's coming out through like if it was the birth canal. On top of all that, it says that she has a crown of 12 stars on her head. Leo the lion is on her head for whatever reason during this time. That constellation moved there. Now Leo has only got nine stars. So those constellations have been there for th thousands of years. But what has happened is, for whatever reason, on this day only, the only day that this could happen... Venus, Mercury, and Mars come in line right on top of each other, right next to Leo, giving her, for the first time in history, 12 stars on her head, the sun and the moon at her feet, and Jupiter coming in. So those events have to stand for something. This is what people are talking about when they're talking about the Revelation 12 prophecy. It's the only time that this prophecy could actually be fulfilled. So what is really going on there? What I'm going to present a little bit is we see at this time that the devil is kicked out of heaven. That's what this prophecy says. 
she has a birth, but we, uh, we know that the accuser many times copies and mimics, mimics a lot of things. Jesus told us in Matthew twenty four thirty seven, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what was it like in the days of Noah? So when we go back to Genesis 6, 4, and 5, it says, There was giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. So it was before the flood and after the flood. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, the same became the mighty men, which were men of old, men of renown. So celestial beings, fallen angels, in the days of Noah came to the earth, mated with women, also animals and other things, corrupted the earth, if you will. God had to flood the earth. Their children then became the giants of old. That's who that some of his children had been, who, who David and Goliath fought. Um, the same giants they saw when, when Israel went into the wilderness and Joshua and Caleb said, we can take them, and everyone else said, no, we are like grasshoppers. This is the same group. God's lineage had been corrupted, polluted. It's why you saw in the Old Testament sometimes they thought God was, geez, he's a mean God, but he'd say, no, kill every man, every animal, everything, because they've all were into this idolatry, had been polluted by these fallen angels. And it, and it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So what we're seeing right here was, is that in the heavenlies, celestial bodies are being cast to the earth before the coming of our Lord is what's coming to the earth. Daniel, the prophet, he gave, he gave several prophecies, but he gave one of the, of the head of gold and the arm and chest of silver and the waist of bronze and the feet of iron and, and, and the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. So he, he gives this prophet, prophecy in Daniel 2, 40 through 43. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for much as you saw the, uh, saw the iron mixed with the miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they, whoever they is, and I'm going to say were at this time, as it was in the times of Noah, so will it be at the coming of man, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Celestial beings coming to the earth as it was in the day of Noah. These celestial beings that at this point in September are being kicked out. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So Daniel goes on with some prophecies, but to set this up, we see over that John in Revelation 17, in 17, 10, and 11, and he says, And there are seven kings, and this is in John's day, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when it comes, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goes into perdition. So when John wrote that, you know, you had the, the, the Egyptian kingdom, followed by the Assyrian kingdom, followed by the Babylonian kingdom. Then you remember that you saw the handwriting on the wall, and the Medes and the Persians came, so that, that was four kingdoms. Then... Alexander the Great came. So that was five kingdoms at the time that John wrote that, that had already had fallen, and then Rome, and one which is. So Rome was the kingdom at the time he wrote that. After that, after Rome, you get the Ottoman Empire with the Turks. Pretty much what you read in the Bible, everything is Jerusalem-centric. So it says the world, they're, they're talking the Middle East. Out of, that then ended around world, the end of World War I there. 
then it was not, but it will come again. I will contend that this, this Turkish empire is what is coming again, where this Antichrist will be coming out of. Because if you remember, after Alexander the Great, and, and, and many pictures of Alexander the Great show him actually as one of these giants or one of these Nephilims. He has the horns on his head. Um, he is a contaminated being, if you will, that had uh, destroyed everything very quickly. Um, so we get to the point where when the Medes and the Persians and Alexander the Great was finally conquered and was going to die, he did something unusual. He didn't give the kingdom to his children. He said, give it to the strong. And so his kingdom was divided up between his four generals. This is where we saw the king of the north, the south. And, and out of this northern kingdom, which would be present day Turkey and Iran, Sunni empires, is where the Antichrist comes out of. The king of the north will fight against the king of the south. So I'd look at it more as the battle. Um, I think the world will be affected, but it's the Middle East. You see today, this wouldn't surprise you, you've got the, the Shiites in the north and the Sunnis in the south still fighting today for this kingdom. Saudi Arabia would be from the kings from the south. It would be interesting if there's any daughter from Saudi Arabia that marries someone from Turkey, their, their leadership. It's, it's an event. It says it happens in the Bible. So Daniel goes on. Th that's, that's just to give you where this Antichrist is supposed to be coming out of. It's not George Bush. It's not Bill Clinton. It's, it doesn't fit where he's got to come from. He's going to come from a Muslim country. Every nation that Jesus fights against when he comes back is a Muslim nation. So this other stuff, uh, our Western mindset, doesn't fit the, the biblical narrative. So Daniel says, and speaking of the, the Antichrist, in Daniel 7.25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand, and tell a times, time, and dividing of time. That same period that it talked about in that Revelation 12 prophecy. In Daniel 9, 27, he says, And he shall conserve the covenant with many for one week. So the Antichrist, there has to be a time when Israel is surrounded by her enemies and war breaks out. Well, we can see right now that Iran's right up to the border with the Syrian war of the Golan Heights. Hezbollah, funded by Iran, they actually shoot missiles across, right across the road into Israel, and they just, they're nice enough to time them so they're around 8.30 in the morning, so hopefully they can hit a school bus full of kids as they're going to school. But that's not so much a problem. The problem is that they're building apartments in occupied territory. But it says then, that's just kind of sad humor, <laughs> but uh, that the world thinks of that. Daniel 9.27 says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week has she caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abomination that shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Again, in Daniel 12, 11, he gives us a third time. He says, and from the time of the daily sacrifice shall be taken out of the way, and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there be sh shall be 1,290 days. So there's that same time period again that we're seeing now in, in uh, four different prophecies that after that period, this Antichrist will be revealed, will show himself in the temple, and we will see this. So three and a half years, the devil's on the earth. Jesus said in Matthew 24:15. When you speak, he was speaking to his disciples, speaking to his church. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso reads, let him understand. So he's given us a warning what to look for. I'm not going to go in to the direction of all on, on the timing of the rapture of the church. I'm just saying Christians are seeing this. So what happens? What does this Jezebel do, and who is this Jezebel? 
Um, to get started on it, I'm going to do just a real quick, a little brief uh, outline on, on Islam so we can understand what's going on. The Quran, the book that they read, basically means thus says Allah. Like we have an Old Testament, we also have a New Testament. They've also got the Hadith, which kind of stands for thus says Muhammad. So if you spoke to a Muslim and said, do you believe in Jesus Christ? They'd say, oh, yes, we do. Of course, it's in the Quran. He is, he is a prophet. He is a holy man of God. They actually believe that Jesus Christ will come back, but when he comes back, he'll be a Muslim, and he will lead the Christians to be Muslim or they'll be killed. But in the Hadith, that's where you get the things that say, yeah, but, but Allah has no son. We're not praying to the same God as what the world has taken us, this one road leads. That, that's what's going to happen. In fact, the Quran has many stories that, that are parallel our Bible. The Quran says that a treaty with the Jews will be made, and, and, and the Jewish person will come from the tribe of Aaron. The Mahadi, this 12th Iman, will come when the world is in great chaos. That is this Antichrist. What our Bible calls the Antichrist and a bad dude, the Quran calls their Mahadi and who they're waiting for, their Savior. It's why when you're dealing with a nation, especially with nuclear weapons, it's not like dealing with Russia or China who respect, you know, mutual catastrophe. You know, we launch on them, they launch on us. That doesn't matter in Iran. They, they, they provoke that because their savior comes when the world's in chaos and blown up. I mean, they're already blowing themselves up with suicide bombers. So that's what they're waiting for. That's what they're prophesying prophesying in fact what we call to say a lie or to be a deceiver would be negative in our bible it is actually um, a great thing in the quran allah is referred to as the great deceiver that's why there's a story is told that when muhammad was starting islam and he he told his he had few followers at the time that allah told him that they were to take a pilgrimage to Mecca to worship Allah and as and trying to get them all to follow him so they took off on this pilgrimage but as they were crossing Jewish land they wouldn't let him pass and in fact Muhammad was greatly humiliated um, they didn't you know obviously they didn't kill him or kill anyone but he was made fun of and they're like you know you thought you were this great this great prophet you said we were going to go on this, pil this pilgrimage and we were going to Mecca. The followers probably should have figured it out right then. But it's a classic example of the end justifies the means. And Muhammad made the comment, but I did not say that we would make the pilgrimage this year. Just that we would make the pilgrimage. And they signed a treaty with the Jews for 10 years. And so the way Islam thinks is when they were weak and they couldn't do what they wanted to do, they, they would make a treaty. But as time went on, about five, six years, Islam grew and they then were the stronger tribe and they went and conquered that tribe that they made a peace treaty with. The term used to describe this peace treaty is in the Quran is Hudna. We did Hudna. This is why when Arafat did the Oslo Accord, and made a peace treaty with Israel, with, with Clinton. Uh, and when he got back in front of the Palestinian people, they were like, what are you doing? What are you doing making a peace treaty with these people? And Arafat's answer was, Hudna. I say to their face what they want to hear because we're abiding our time when we will take over Israel. It's why you'll see uh, Islam today telling us what we want to hear to our face about mosque and stuff like that. But all along, they're planning when they are stronger that they will take over and, and put in Sharia law. So Mecca in Saudi Arabia, that's where the, the Muslims walk around that Hajj, that little black building. In the corner of the Hodge is the Kaaba stone. Sarah, you want to put that other picture up? It's that little black stone down at the, down at the corner of, of it. 
They all go march around it and they'll go rub it. It's the same stone that was found in Acts 19.35. So listen to this. And when the town clerk had appeared, the, had appeased the people, he said, You men of Ephesus, what man is there that knows not how that the city of Ephesus is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and the image which fell from Jupiter? Remember we just showed earlier Jupiter going into Virgo and that these are celestial beings now coming? So... To show the, the, how demonic it is, even which they have as their emblem, is, is the 666 on, on their cornerstone there. They will tell you that it's exactly 666 miles uh, from Mecca, or from the building, from the Hajj, to the dome on the rock. Um, it, is a demonic, it is a demonic religion. Other names for this Diana is also the, the name Jezebel, okay? But she goes by other names. Uh, Ishtar is the Babylonian god, and not the Canaanite. Ashtoreth would be known as the Syrian Phoenician, and of course we had Diana, which was the Roman god at the time. Artemis is, is the Greek, and, 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 and the goddess has both a male and female connotation to it. They are both. That's why I was talking to him earlier. I said, this is why you're seeing uh, what's being coming on the earth, the homosexual marriage, the transvestites that are coming, because the celestial beings are bringing that onto the earth. It's, they're, they're getting stronger. Uh, Aphrodite and Venus would be in the Greek. Isis, the, the Egyptian. Kali is the Hindu mother god that has uh, Shiva, as her daughter, or they kind of copy everything in the Bible, but Shiva is the exact representation of Kala, kind of like the son is of the father. But that is the same statue that, if anyone paid attention to what's going on over there at CERN that they have out there in Sweden, where they're doing these, these colliders and colliding these atoms, trying to open up portals, very similar what man did at the, at the Tower of Babel, to open up portals to talk to an unseen world. That is Shiva. She is known as the Destructure. The other names for, for Kala, the mother, and how this all fit together is Mother of the Universe, the Virgin Goddess. Um, Lilith is the name when it has to do with witchcraft. But to show you how deception could be coming, other names for Jezebel or Shiva as it relates to Kali, is um, Our Lady of Fatima, the Virgin Mary, the Queen of Heaven. Remember back in Jeremiah when they made cakes to the Queen of Heaven? This is the same God that they were worshiping, bringing in. The same stone that fell from a meteorite from heaven within, in, in Paul's day there in Acts. It's the same stuff. Back in those days, here we are 2,000 years later, and the same events are happening as those are coming to the earth. Revelation 9.1 says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. And to him was given the keys of the bottomless pit. It did not say to it, and, you know, a star fell, a meteorite, it. No, it called it a him. So things are coming. Things are coming to the earth. This is what we need to be preparing for. Isaiah 14, 12 says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? So the, what Jezebel, I'll just use Jezebel instead of all the other names, has done throughout history is to come and was to divide up or to spoil what God made good. God made man in his own image. It came to, to divide mankind, to try and make his own like God. That's what it did way back in, in the days of Noah. It's doing it again. Jesus said, says in Matthew 12, 25, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, 
Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. So when we let Jezebel into this nation, into Des Moines, into your home, Jezebel's job is to divide, to conquer, and to destroy. The same pictures, your statues you see of Jezebel be the same that you would see of Shiva. You know, she's there, usually it's female, with a necklace of skulls around her neck and holding skulls and skulls she's standing on because she seduces her victims. Could be a, a pastor in a church or a husband in a home, or it could be, a, it could be a, in a male also. But the idea is not that celestial beings are lusting after. The plan is to destroy whatever is God's, whatever is the church. Ephesians 4 and 3 says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's what we're needing to do. If, if we, the world's not going to do this. If, no one has to look very far if you look at our politics today to say it is the most divided that I've ever seen it. It's only going to come through the church. Pastor spoke about it a little bit through, through, through our love and, and the teachings of the Bible to bring this nation together. If we let it stay divided, it will be defeated. It's up to us to humble ourselves and pray. I'm going to read you something here. You don't necessarily have to agree with this at all. Um, there's been kind of a reason why almost every night, uh, either Cheryl or I, and Cheryl was gone this week, but it's, it comes 3 o'clock in the morning, and bang, I'm wide awake. And I'm like, oh, man, I wish it was just, you know, like 6. But it's 3 in the morning, so you get up and you pray, and you're asking God. So here's something. Second uh, Thessalonians 2, 1 through 11. I'm going to read you something. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together to him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholds, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him who's coming after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying spirits and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So we normally look at that as the one who lets until he be taken out of the way. Um, a lot of people say, well, that's, that's the Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit's gone, the, the church is gone. I'm going to ask you to look at it from a different perspective. The, the word let, I looked it up in my Strong's, and it was 27, 22 in the Greek, which, which actually means to hold down, to possess, to retain. So the one, you could read it, the one who possesses or holds you back is, is doing that, and how he be taken out of the way. So if these celestial beings are coming, and they were taken out of the way from the second heaven, so Jesus said he saw, he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, from the third heaven to the second. That is why Daniel in his prayer had to pray for 21 days because his prayer was held up in the battle in the second heaven, and finally he kept praying. And God sent the Archangel Michael to assist to bring him his prayer for 21 days. But now we're at a point where Satan and his gang is being hurled to the earth. Why? Because 
it says that Satan then gives his power to this Antichrist so he'll be revealed. We don't know who that is. I'm contending it's very possible that after September 23rd, probably not the next day, but if these events happen, I don't know, it could take a day, a week, a year, 10 years, that the Antichrist is being revealed. That is the purpose for his coming. He's going to give this man his power, and the Lord will fight and take him out of the way. If it is the Holy Spirit, let's look at Mark 13. I'm going to start with verse 4. You can also be very similar in Matthew 24, Luke 21. They all tell the same story. The disciples come to Jesus and they say, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when you shall hear of wars and rumors of war, be you not troubled. That's today. That's where we're at today. For such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. But take heed to yourself, for they shall deliver you up to councils. And in the synagogues you shall be beaten. And you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be preached among all nations. But when they lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak. Neither do you premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour that you, for it is not you that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Okay, I guess the Holy Ghost wasn't taken out of the way. It's still there, at least during that time. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. But when you shall see, so this is, this, Jesus is continuing this whole thing. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation, so that's the fifth time the Bible has told us that when you see this, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that reads understand. Then let him that be in Judea flee to the mountains. And let him that is in the housetop not go down to the housetop, neither enter there and to take things out of his house. So he goes through basically the same thing in Matthew and Luke and John and what happens that two are taken and one is left. This is where we would say the rapture of the church. I'm not going to get into when that happens or what we want to call it. I'm just saying that, that there are events happening on the earth that the church sees. So we got to say, well, why is this happening? Revelation 2 and 10. So this now we're back. John sees this. This is the church in Revelation 2. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be, that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation 10 days. Be you faithful to death and I'll give you a crown of life. So he's telling us to hold on. There, there, there's a message in that. It was actually a message even which we'll touch on a little bit. Um, um, Apostle Keith talked about it today of his life going through struggles in his life to become the man that he, sh he needs to be. It's the same thing of what we're going through. God says that he disciplines those he loves and that you should consider hardship as discipline. His church goes through some things, but the church doesn't go through the wrath of God. There comes a time when God protects and he comes down. And all those, he says, I will contend with those who contend with you. I reserve my wrath for your enemies. Revelation 2 and 20 says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against you. So now he's talking to us of what we need to do. Because you permit that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my service servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols so the lord's not pleased at all for us to let that carry on in the church that's why we're here to get rid of this to get the bride without spot or wrinkle we can't let it in all things were created by the lord and for the lord that's what the bible says celestial beings 
the devil, demons, all that stuff, God's in control. He's not taken by surprise. It is doing something as his children are going through something and rising up. 1 Peter 1 and 7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold. Luke 18 and 8 says when the Son of Man come, shall he find faith on the earth. That's what the Lord is looking for in us. When you're going through something, will he find faith? Will we stand? He gave us many examples of praying through. In Luke, he gave the example of uh, uh, the unrighteous judge. So a woman had, had wanted deliverance from something. She wanted justice. And, the, and it said the judge did not care about the woman, but at least she not wear him out, he will give her her justice telling us keep praying it's what we got to do today not to grow weary in well-doing he gave another parable about a man coming to see his friend who's already in bed for the night and he said he kept asking hey do you got any bread i'm on a trip and he says hey I'm, I'm in bed my kids are bed go away and he said he won't help the man because he's his friend but because of his importunity which is a word used to ask with repeated request that he would give him all that he needs. Jesus asked three times at the night of his passion, Lord, if it be your will, take this cup from me, but not my will be done. He didn't stop. He came back later. He asked the same thing. He came back the third time. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. He asked three different times. Daniel fasted for 21 days and prayed the same thing. So it seems like what is happening is in that second heaven where our prayers are being held up, that that's where you keep praying. And God, if, if you're not like the waves of the sea, as it says in James, you stay consistent. He will send those to assist. And in Daniel's prayer, it was Archangel Michael even to come in war, to bring that prayer. What I'm going to suggest is for the church right now where we're at, these things are coming as this second heaven is cleared out and comes to earth. The Bible says, Daniel says that those who know their God will do exploits. Why? Because the second heaven's cleared out. You who stay by faith and continue to pray are going to get almost instantaneous answers back. Where we're going to see healings. We're going to see miracles. God is not going to let celestial beings come and battle flesh alone. Where sin abounds, so much more grace abounds. This is what we're getting prepared for. This is what the prophets, when, when you listen, say, hey, Jezebel's coming but so is signs and wonders from the church being built up for this time. So we've been asking ourselves, why aren't things? Why aren't things? I'm telling you, it's coming. Stay strong. Stay in this. Um, Eric said something tonight. which kind of made me jump out when he asked, if, if you, is anyone getting sin on to death? And I said, oh, my goodness. I haven't heard that, but, but the martyr spirit... I said, Lord, that's what I'm praying, that, that we as a body of people would just come, whatever our king asked, to have that set in our heart, kind of like where Jesus was when, when he was going to go back to Jerusalem, and they said, Lord, they, you know, yesterday they're going to stone you. And they didn't even have to ask him a question. They looked at his countenance, and they said, yeah, never mind. He's going back to Jerusalem. He had a purpose in what he was doing. Listen, from the beginning... This serpent is going to snap at, snip at your heels and you are to crush the head. Nowhere was the body of Christ supposed to escape. We're to fight this thing forever long until he takes us. I don't know what that is. I'm going to pretend to know, but I know what we're to do until that happens. So that's what we're supposed to do. Romans 11.25 says, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Least you, you should be wise in your own conceits that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. You want to know when the rapture is going to happen? When some full number that God has picked of Gentiles come in. It's going to coincide exactly with the wedding of the bride as God the Father is going to tell the son now like a Jewish wedding, now go get your bride, whenever that is. No one knows the date or the hour.
this, this martyrdom. So I say things that people, they get scared because they're thinking the tribulation period. I'm going to tell you, there are people right now, if you lived in Mosul or if you lived in Syria, they're not really too concerned about the tribulation period. They're living it. If you're a Christian in Bethlehem, it's all, the, the birthplace of Jesus is almost extinct from Christians anymore. They've all been killed. I remember that picture of that, that nine-year-old, eight, nine-year-old girl in, in the white and blue dress laying in a pool of blood because they cut off her head because they said, will you renounce Jesus? And she said, no. And Isis cut off her head. Do you think those people are worried about the tribulation? They're living it. But this is what Revelation 6, 9, and 11 says. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they crowded with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them. And it was said to them that they should rest yet for a little season and tell their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they would should be fulfilled. That is the spirit of martyrdom, which Jesus is talking about, where the people need to get their hearts. I'm not saying anyone wants to be killed. I'm saying let's get our hearts to that direction. It's where we have to go. Romans 4, or Revelation 14, 13 said, And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed! are the dead which die in the Lord from hereafter. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So we are to get rid of the escapism mentality. If I see something that's going on in the church that's preached a lot, I hear that over and over, that church, this is coming and that's coming, but praise God, we're out of here. Defeating the whole purpose of what God was trying to do, even with his son, it said it pleased the father to bruise the son for your sakes. We go through things, not the wrath, not bad things, but we're going to go through some things that are coming on the earth. This is our hour. This is our time to shine. This is now where the, where the people in the church, as iron sharpens iron, we need to take that step. It's too late. To wait any longer we got to go all the way in all the way in this idea of this escapism is not new it was in Jesus's day in Matthew 16 20 through 25 it says then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ from that time forth began Jesus to show to his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be. But he turned and he said to Peter, Get you behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you savor not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So men, men are going to come to you and say, well, God is love, and this loving God wouldn't do this. But God will say, then said Jesus to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. The good news is, second, so, when tribulation comes or troubles come, it's coming. It's always come. It's always been there in the church. Clear back with, with Israel and Egypt. Second Peter 2 and 9 says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and how to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. The, the, the three Hebrew boys in the fire were not delivered from the fire. They went into the fire and then were delivered. Israel was right there with Egypt during the plagues, but the plagues did not touch them. Thurman was here. What was the whole premise of Thurman? Not the whole premise, but remember he had the even cards on uh, um, Psalms 91? 
Why is that coming out? He's not the only pastor that I've heard all of a sudden preaching Psalms 91 over and over again. It's now coming. I'm hearing the, the prophets say Jezebel's coming, and I'm hearing Psalm 91. He that dwelled in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence, and he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor by the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. God will protect you in the struggle. The struggle is to develop us. So how do we fight the dragon? Jezebel. We know she's coming. This, there's only one way. This scripture kind of hit me in the, tre- in the chest because it, it described me. 1 Corinthians 1, 22-23. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Well, Pat, you're, you're, you're doing healings. You want to see signs and wonders. You want to get revelation from your Bible and study that. You're no different than what they were. And Paul gave the answer. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. The only way we are going to fight. We are now entering into a level. So when I was preaching here on Jezebel coming, celestial beings are coming. The Bible tells us that's coming. We can't fight it with wisdom, with knowledge. You got one answer. There's only one way. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ crucified. He has the power. He has the authority. He overcome by the blood of the Lamb. He overcome by word of his testimony. And We don't value our lives so much even on to death. That is our mindset for what is coming. Jeremiah 12, 5 says, If you have run with footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? Well, let me tell you something. Horses are coming. There's a white horse coming to conquer. There's a red horse coming to take peace away. There's a black horse that has has the scales weighed in the balance. And there's a pale horse bringing death and hell with it. It's coming. September 23rd is when it's saying that that starts this process. Again, I don't know if it's the next day or 10 years after that. They still got to build a temple in Jerusalem. It's not right away. But that's what's coming. 2 Thessalonians 1, 4 and 5 says, So that we ourselves glory in you and the church of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. What you're going through is a token, righteous token from God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. So this is what I want to say about Jezebel. There's a whole lot of teaching. Cheryl's going to touch a little bit on it, but we've got a manual. This was a day and a half seminar with Bob Larson. She's got a lot of other stuff. Um, Elaine even gave her some stuff. Cheryl's probably got three or four books. So there's a lot to it. Um, What I'd like to say is that when you remember Jehu, mighty man of God that, that... that God sent Elijah to to anoint him king. Defeated two kings on his way. And Jezebel was up in the tower. Elijah had just defeated 400 prophets of Baal. Mighty man of God. Conquer. Probably bold at the time. Saying, yeah, I'm the man. I'm the man. I brought fire down. I just killed 400. Got in the presence of Jezebel and fled. Who conquered Jezebel? A couple eunuchs up in the window. No struggle, nothing. It wasn't the great king. It wasn't the great man of God. It was probably the two most humble people on earth. 
If you're a eunuch and you're a slave, you're about as low as it gets. And that conquered Jezebel easily. That is a key on how we fight this. Jezebel's come. Her main mode is, to, is the worship of self in one way or form. She is going to try and control. She's going to try and destroy the prophets. We overcome by repentance, by humility, and by intercessory prayer. Those are the only things that are going to work on what is coming on our world, I guess, if you will. The last thing I, I wanted to say, which is, to me, is, a, is an encouragement. In Deuteronomy 29, 22, it says, so that the generation to come, and, and w- when you look that up, it really says the last generation. Speaking about the last generation. Basically, you could say from 1967 on, after the Six-Day War, when Israel got Jerusalem back from, from Gentile control, if you will, time started counting, the, the last generation. It says, the Lord set the time and place for all men to live. You, everyone in here, was chosen by God to be here right now in this place, in this city, to battle this battle that God says to fight. He is our head. He's fighting. The body's to come along beside. The dragon is coming. It's going to snip at your heels. And if you do nothing and run and flee, it's going to divide the kingdom. But God says to fight and to conquer this thing. And he's going to give everyone all the tools to do it. I firmly believe that there's a change coming. The change at this point is take that step. Where you hesitate before. Well, should I go speak to that person? Take the step. God is going to anoint you. He said in his word that, that those who know their God will do exploits because he's not going to let you fight celestial beings. You don't have a chance, but he's in you. He's warring. This is our time, and this is our hour. This is why certain men are saying, man, I've really gotten this martyr's mantle or just, you know, I want to go all the way here with God. What, what is this that I'm, I'm like, yeah, it's been getting me up almost every night saying, what does that mean? So this is where I'm going to turn it um, over to Cheryl, where she's, she's got a few words, I think maybe a video or something, and is going to lead into down the road some specific plans on how to deal with Jezebel. And then when we're all done, you know, I just, by faith, I'm just saying if anyone wants to we'll just pray for you if there's Jezebel anywhere we're to get it out of the church if it's in me there's a lot of things that when I read this Eric is more than anyone has been doing self-deliverance that's why I had to say to myself Pat you need to be humble oh Pat you're seeking after knowledge you're seeking after signs you know repent of that it's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ crucified follow your king wherever he takes you so Well, hello. (laughs) This might be the biggest miracle you've seen tonight, me being up here. (laughs) Anyway, um, um, everyone has had to face a giant or will sometime in their lifetime. But if you keep your eyes on the Lord and and not with your lips murmur about the problem that you're going through, that you'll have the victory. I was going to speak a lot on Jezebel today, but I had to face a lot of giants this week. Um, I've had people that's helped me. Uh, Elaine has, I've gotten call. I've called her quite a few times to pray. Our uh, dog that my daughter had got backed over and broke its leg. Uh, my grandson, while we were watching him at the park, broke his arm. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to keep praising God and, and doing everything. And then it turned around that my son ended up going to Thurman. <laughs> and so sometimes when um, when Satan hits you, he hits you hard. And he'll even step on you harder because he has no uh, compassion for you or anything. He's just, he's just going for the whole thing. So we got to be really careful how we conduct ourselves, how we show ourselves to people through the trials because that ministers to them. 
you know, and, and we're not the only ones that's gone through these trials, you know, everybody has and stuff, so um, what I've got now is a video and it talks about the giants in our life and uh, if Eric wants to pass out the giant and, and nobody's going to look at these papers or anything, but if you want to just put down your giants and then uh, there'll be a, another step that we'll do after that. Today I'm with John Ramirez. He's here to tell us about his new book, Out of the Devil's Cauldron. I know we have a lot of giants. I know there's been a lot of prayer requests in the church, you know, and, and they think, people think, man, this is more than I can bear. This is too much, you know, but yet God is the answer, you know, and stuff. So I know our grandson, I forgot to mention, this was another one that I found out last week. So it was another giant, but, you know, I don't look at him anymore. I, I, want, I don't want to talk the problem. I want to talk the answer. And he's got a weed allergy, a peanut allergy, an egg allergy, a gluten allergy, and a milk allergy. And so how do you serve those kids? You know, he comes to my house for breakfast, and it's like, can you have, can't have milk, you know. So, and anyway, I was so pleased that when my son did talk to me, he said that we went to 
Thurman and I said, well, did just you and Darcy go? And he goes, no, I took my three boys. And so, there we go. Anyway, so I had sent these papers out. Sometimes it's easier when you write the problems down and then you go back and you see when God answers and stuff. And I'm just going to read this little bit and then I've got another video and stuff. Sorry about all the videos here, but um, I will get on Jezebel. But it, it's such a topic that I really want to do good, you know, and being gone all that time and, and stuff. And I just, I know the Lord, he's so gracious and merciful. Because I got up at 6 this morning and I said, Lord, what do you want me? He goes, it's not you. You know, it's not me that's given it. He says, just, I said, well, what do you want the people to have today? And I think he wants us to, to get the answer, not the problem, you know. So anyway, it says, Jesus came to earth and launched his ministry of preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, healing the sick and setting captives free. His message and his ministry were intimately connected. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He declared calling people to repentance. He demonstrated the reality of God's kingdom by casting out demons and healing all kinds of sickness and disease. While we often reduce the gospel to only include only forgiveness of sins, Jesus demonstrated a gospel that entitled much more. It included total deliverance from the kingdom of darkness, freedom from the grip of sin, healing of disease, and restoring what was lost in the fall of mankind. One of the evidences of this truth is the word that is commonly translated as salvation in the New Testament. The word sozo is used interchangeably for salvation, healing, and deliverance. In Matthew 1.21, the angel Gabriel speaks this prophetic word to Mary about the son she is about to carry into the world. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save, sozo, his people from their sins. Here is an example of sozo being used for physical healing. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you, sozo. And immediately received his sight and followed Jesus on the road, Mark 10:52. In Luke 8, 36, sozo is used to describe a man who was delivered from demons. They also who had seen it, told them by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed, sozo. There are many other examples of the word sozo in the New Testament, but the point is that the cross has provided for total salvation. God never intended salvation without deliverance, and he never wanted the benefit of physical healing to be removed from the salvation experience. But for so long, we have preached a message of forgiveness only. We have total faith that if a person comes to Jesus, repents of their sins, and receives G him as Lord, that his sins are forgiven. But do we have the same level of faith to believe that that same pe person would be healed of a sickness or delivered from demons? As a whole, we certainly do not, but we must get there. It is time to recapture Sozo. On the same cross, Jesus bore our sins and our sicknesses. Isaiah 53, 4 through 5, and Matthew 8, 16 through 17, he paid the penalty for so sozo, salvation, healing, and deliverance. Let's embrace the gospel that Jesus preached, the gospel of his kingdom. Let's contend for the ex full expression of this gospel to be released in the earth. And so they had passed out, I think, the cross, and so you can write on that, that Everything that you're asking God for is already paid for, already done. So when you have those, um, you know, Goliath, those little things on the side, and you can say, hey, Jesus already done it. Anyway, um, I was going to read the final conflict, and it kind of is long, but it does say a lot about the end times and a little bit about spirits and stuff, and then... Um, but I do have a video that's 28 minutes long. So do you want to just go into that video and then yeah. you do? Okay. Yep. Today I'm with John Ramirez. He's here to tell us about his new book, Out of the Devil's Cauldron. Now I got to tell you, much of what I have read in this book and much of what I've heard from John is absolutely hard to believe. It's the kind of thing you see in movies. It's the kind of thing you read about in fantasy and lore. I will tell you that what I have described and what you'll hear about today is not fantasy. It's real. And your understanding it 
or not could make the difference between where you are or where God wants you to be. John, I want to welcome you to the show today. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a pleasure being here. Humbled by this wonderful opportunity to come here on your amazing show. I know God's going to do amazing things. Amen. I believe that he is. And I think that everyone watching right now is about to see the lid lifted in their life. They're about to be exposed to something that I described in the open that is happening in their world. Maybe it's in their finances. Maybe it's in their health. Maybe it's in their relationships. There is a war for our future. There is a battleground that we are stepping onto every single day. And while we are trying to get ahead in life, there is a real force, a real enemy called the devil yes. that is there to stop us, there to keep us from getting ahead. And you, John, today, as you sit in front of me, you're not the enemy. No. Today no. you're a friend. Today I'm a friend. But you were, reading your biography, you were a third ranked high devil priest worshiper. in the demonic army. Yes, I was. Explain. Tell us, tell us a little bit so the viewer can get an understanding of your background, what you came out of. I came from a line of warlocks and witches from my father's side of the family. And I was initiated at the age of nine to be trained by witches and warlocks, going to demonic church from seven in the evening to five in the morning. Wow. So when I go to Christian church now, it's two hours. I go like, that's it? Two hours? <laughs> so, so I was recruited into the realm of, of witchcraft, into spiritualism, to learn to be the third high ranked of a worshiper for 25 years. Because a lot of people watching hear this and don't really understand the magnitude of how real the spiritual realm is. Absolutely. I mean, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. My job is to paralyze you in the spirit realm because everything starts in the spirit realm. If I can paralyze you in the spirit realm, then whatever has to happen in the natural won't happen. So I will operate in the spirit realm. The spirit realm is more real than the realm that we are in now because everything starts in the spirit realm. It's more real than the oxygen you breathe. It's what's happening in the spirit realm. There's a wall taking place. I have to keep you away from the plan of God no matter what, at any cost. You keep saying you. So when you say that to me, I'm understanding you to mean that when you were in Satan's army, I'm just gonna say it like mm -hmm. it is. Oh, absolutely. You would actually take on the role of a soldier for the devil. Yes. To do what in the spirit realm? In other words, to do witchcraft, to do tower car readings, to do uh, spells, to paralyze that, their, their neighborhood so the Christ, the cross won't reach that neighborhood. So the people in that neighborhood will know that it was a spirit of poverty, a spirit of prostitution, drugs. I keep it, I feed that spirit in the neighborhood to control that neighborhood so the cross of Jesus Christ will not come into that neighborhood. If you're a believer, to make you believe that the Christ you serve wasn't real, he was a fantasy. The cross is a fantasy. The cross is a figure of your imagination. I was very good at that. I had like a PhD doing that. Wow. And then after that, I discredit the cross because I have to discredit the cross because if I can discredit the cross, you have nowhere to run to. Sure. So you were vulnerable. You were in the middle of nowhere. So now I can come and attack. It's like a lion. He chased the, he chased the hurdle. He goes after the weakest prey. And then he attacks and focuses on that weakest prey, so he brings us down. So I, I, I have to separate you from the cross. So if I'm able to separate you from the cross and to make it a figure of imagination, I knew that there was gateways and portals that you were open because you were struggling. So I would hold on to that and then bring you down. Well, I would sit in the church. I would go to church as a demon man and sit in the church and break the unity of the church or break the unity of the spirit going on so people won't get saved. Wow. What was your goal? What was the, game? What was the end, end game? Move up the ranks as a devil worshiper. Move up the ranks, make my daddy proud. Did you, fulfill my assignment. Did you actually see things you couldn't explain take place? I, mean, I would sit with the devil like I'm sitting you with to today. I would talk to the devil all night long. He would manifest in human form. He would come into my house. The, the present would change. The atmosphere would change. The, the room would change. Your present was there. I sold my, my soul to the devil. I got the marks in my body here. I got the marks here. I got the marks here. I got the pentagram carved into my flesh. So I would sit with the devil all night long and speak to the devil because the devil wanted fellowship. Now, John, you can appreciate that's hard to believe. I'm not questioning you. I'm saying that people watching right now are saying, wait a minute, I see that in the movies, but this doesn't happen in real life. Right. How, how do we respond to that? I mean, you really saw the devil. Yeah, absolutely. Sat with the home, sat with demons, principality. There's, there's, there's two worlds. There's, there's, there's a kingdom of, the, of darkness and the kingdom of heaven. There's people that seen angels. There's people that had in contact with Christ. So if you can see that, then there's a devil. Sure. 
There's an opposite. Right. If you, you can't just believe part of the Bible. Exactly. You can't believe in miracles and not expect to see them. You can't believe exactly. in, in that Jesus raised from the dead right. and not believe in that kind of real supernatural world is what you're describing. Right. And you saw it. I saw it. I lived, lived it, it for 25 years. I mean, you can't, Jesus talked to my more about demons, cast out more demons. Wasn't that a third of his ministry? Exactly. Why do we not see more of that today? Because the church is preaching people happy, they're not preaching people free. Say that again. The church is preaching people happy, but they're not preaching people free. People, Christians are coming in in bondage and, and, and shackles and strongholds and, and, and generational curses in the, in the pastors. And no disrespect to anyone's ministry because I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm a believer. I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm on the side. I'm on the right side. But I can't preach you free, but I'm preaching you happy. Right. You know, it's like a sugar rush. I'm giving you a sugar rush, but I'm not really, you're not being healed. You're not right. being delivered. You're not being set free. Right. Well, there's a place for that. I mean, I, I would agree there's a place for that kind of ministry. But equally... There's a place for someone to be able to speak into a circumstance with real experience, who has experienced, lived, been deep in the demonic world, and can say to someone that is just trying to live happy, it's not a matter of state of mind, it's not a matter of just feeling happy, you've got some gateways in your life that Amen. you've got to shut, mm -hmm. we've got to do some spiritual surgery, if you will, Exactly. To get them out of the ditch that they're in. That's what you're describing. Right. And exactly. that's your ministry. And that's my ministry. That's my ministry, ministry is to come to set the captives free. People have forgot to, to know that there's a devil to fight. There's demons to cast out. There's, there's, there's a world of darkness that we're in a battle for souls. Sure. Who's going to win souls? Jesus is going to win more souls than the devil is. It's really what it's all about. Exactly. You know, it is a battle for souls. So spiritual warfare is needed. I mean, the, the Bible says it's clear. I mean, when I read the Bible, it comes so much to life. It said the kingdom of, of the light. I used to I used to project. I used to leave my body home and I should project to go to different neighborhoods and put curses in the neighborhood because whatever you can curse on the spirit realm is able to come out of the natural. And the only neighborhood that I was not able to curse it was a Christian that were praying for the neighborhoods. They wow. had a circle of unity praying for the neighborhoods and they used to chase me out to prayer. Wow. With one accord, one unity, praying in the spirit, casting out demons, healing the sick. People need to see the power of God against the power of darkness. And I would submit that most people watching have never really experienced the power of God. No. Nope. They've never seen what you're describing. I mean, I came from a kingdom of darkness. I had a hundred thousand dollar witchcraft stuff in my house. I have human bones in my house. If I would tell you I was gonna kill you in 30 days of witchcraft, I was gonna kill you in 30 days of witchcraft. So today, Jesus had raced everything and took my mess and made it a testimony. Wow. And now I'm, I'm, I'm educating the body of Christ that there's a devil out there that we need to fight. I'm educating the church, the spiritual warfare. We need to stay free. You know, not only, yes, we're freed by the cross, we accepted Jesus. Accepting Jesus gets you into the game, by the way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it, it gets you into the game. Now you have to walk out your Christianity. Mm -hmm. You don't get saved, in other words, and it's all happy from there. Right, it's not all happy. You get from saved, and then the real battle starts. There's devils that are trying to stop your purpose and your destiny. There's devils that are trying to give you, give you, give you an abortion. An abortion by how? But you have a purpose and a destiny that is in you, that God already put in you. He's trying to abort that baby. He's trying to abort that purpose and destiny so you won't reach the cross. You won't reach God's very best. John, what will I find in this book, Out of the Devil's Cauldron? I obviously will find your story, which is a very revealing look at a very real world of darkness. Not what we read about, not what we see on TV, you know, in fantasy books, not what we see on TV, not what we watch in movies a real account of a soldier who was on assignment by the devil mm -hmm. to kill, to steal, Amen. and to destroy a believer's future. Yes. That's what I'm going to find here. Amen. We don't think that there's actually something going on in our everyday life that mm -hmm. in a neighborhood where there's high crime, mm -hmm. prostitution, killing, um, that that's not just the work of people that make bad choices. There's an actual spiritual influence, a demonic force at play in that city. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's on somebody's job. Right. Maybe it's in a home. Mm -hmm. I mean, the spirit realm mm -hmm. is alive, and it's not just bad decisions that people make. It's not just choices that we make. Right. You're saying that sometimes what someone watching right now might be facing might in fact be a demonic attack on their life. That's one thing bugs my mind. Right. You, everybody is angry with God. Well, everybody wants to blame God. When everybody wants to blame way. God for everything. Sure. But no one is blaming the devil these days. The church, everybody's blaming God. I didn't get my boyfriend. I didn't get a girlfriend. I didn't get married. I didn't get a car. I didn't get the promotion. Everybody's blaming God. Right. 
No one's blaming the devil. Do you believe that people watching right now that are facing the challenges of life, and not just everyday challenges, but grips, grips, their bank accounts empty, they are fighting every day with their spouse, they just went to the doctor and found out they had a diagnosis of some disease, maybe they have inflammation that won't go away, maybe they're angry all the time, they're frustrated all the time, they're depressed, they see no hope, all they see is negativity. Do you believe that the devil could be work right now in their life? Oh, absolutely. You know, let, let's put it that if it was something natural, you can fix it. Mm. If it's something natural, it's easy to fix. You can put it together, it might take you some time, but you can get a remedy for it and get it fixed. Whether it's a cold, sickness, whatever, situation in your life, situation at work, situation in your marriage, you can sit down with your wife, talk it out, you can fix it. But if it's something that you can't fix, that is over your head, but you, don't, you try every situation possible to fix it, and you can't fix it. And there's something more at play. It's more to it. It's called supernatural. The devil studies you. The devil is more real. The kingdom of darkness is more real than the oxygen we breathe. He studies you. He has an assignment. He, the Bible said the devil goes as, as, a roaring, as a roaring lion to see who he can devour. He, he, in the book of Job, the, the God asked him, where do you come from? He said, I roam the earth back and forth looking for an opportunity hmm. to see who I can bring down. So the opportunity is you can give your opportunity to God or you can give it to the devil. Wow. Choose who you give it today. You, give your, you can give your life to God or you can give it to the devil. So whatever circumstance you give to, if it's the circumstance of darkness, it's like people, have you ever seen uh, uh, families, uh, this guy's a baseball player, some become a baseball player, generation mm -hmm. of blessings, mm -hmm. but this generation of curses too. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, I, I, my father was an alcoholic, now I'm an alcoholic. Right. So the so devil knows where to hold on to. He knows where is the weak link. He knows what is the open door so, in your life. So if someone is struggling with addiction, mm -hmm. if they can't seem to get, break free of it, you're saying that that could be demonic influence. Oh, absolutely. 99.9, .9, but if it wasn't, he could get free in the natural. If, if I'm struggling with something natural, and, and I'm, I'm struggling with something natural, I can get free because it's natural. It's, I, I, can, I can overcome it. What do you say to people where they ask the question, isn't it just a state of mind? Maybe I'm just chemically addicted, you know? Maybe I can't break free just because it's, it's just, I'm addicted. I pray for this young man, right? He was 26 years bound in schizophrenia. 26 years, chemical imbalance. Mm. He's free today. Manifested, I mean, from his medication, he had nine medications of different kind. And today, praying with him and a wonderful brother in Vegas, Shannon, him and I pray for this brother consistently. We pray for him about 15, 15 to 17 times. We did deliverance. This brother today, is the doctors are done fine. They cannot understand how this man is sound in his mind today. Other areas I explained, you know, the finances and marriage relationships and these other things. Could there actually be a stronghold in people's lives watching right now that they're not aware of? Exactly, because sometimes people are not aware, sometimes out of anger, out of frustration, people speak things into the airwaves. Explain that to me. You, know, you talked about gateways in your book. Mm -hmm. You talked about in your book how you can open gateways and give the devil access into your life to wreak havoc in your life. Right. Explain that if you would for me and the people watching. Say if I was married, right? And I, my, me and my wife had an argument and I, I turned around, I can't, I, you know, I hate this, I hate that, I can't believe this, you know, I hate those kids, I, I, I hate you. Why you make this bad decision? You're no good for nothing. Uh, I can't wait to get divorced from you. Mm. The devil, bang, jumps on that opportunity. He start increasing that temper. He start increasing that circumstance in your house. He start to the point that you lose life in your house. You lose life in your kids. You lose life in your marriage. Now you start getting attracted to other things mm -hmm. because you have opened the door because what you speak is what you become. And so our words really are power. Power, very powerful. And the devil understands this too. To the T. My book, not even my book, I remember Jesus' book, the book that God has given me, has tell you, this is why, this is the reason why. If you follow this, you won't go into this. If you break this pattern, you break this cycle, you would totally be free. Learn how to close the door to the life that is oppressing you, demonizing you. Learn how to close that door once and for all in your life so you don't have to look back anymore. John, what do you say to people who believe if they just get up in the morning and live a good life, go to church, be responsible. Maybe they're not having issues with some of the dark stuff, mm -hmm. you know? They're not doing drugs, they're not engaged in pornography, they're not doing things that most of us would agree are gateways to the enemy. They're just living a good life. Is, are they susceptible to demonic attack? Are they susceptible to demonic influence? You might say, well, maybe I'm not like the next guy, he's caught up in pornography, or he, I'm not like the next guy, he's cheating on his wife, or I'm not like the, you know, you might, you might categorize your sin in categories. Got it. God, God sees sin as sin. Got it. One sin can keep you away from heaven. It kept Adam away from the garden, one situation. It kept Esau, one bowl of soup, cost him his birthrights. 
one situation can keep it. The devil can use one situation to hold you from God's very best. And you might think it's light. He can use a situation as a, as a gateway you described. As a gateway, book. as a portal to get a grip, to have an asset, to have a stronghold in your life. And what does he do with that stronghold? What is his mission? The obvious, to keep us from heaven. But the devil, as you describe, is doing so much more than that. It's not just on a mission to capture our soul, to keep us from our heavenly home. Amen. He's on a mission to destroy our life here on planet Earth. And that stronghold has to come down. Doubt, unbelief, fear, oppression, depression. There's Christians right now taking so much medication. There's Christians today cutting themselves. Mm. Why, why is that? I mean, I mean, it, to me, it boggles my mind that, that we serve a mighty God. Not that we have to live a perfect life, because we're not gonna live a perfect life, but even in my storms, I have peace. There's Christians that walk around, they don't have no peace. Sure. And so your book will describe how to overcome that battlefield that's at war in the mind? Oh yeah, absolutely, to describe. To, you can't kill something you cannot identify. You can't stop something you cannot identify. You know, to prayer, to fasting, to, to surrender to God. If I'm struggling with something, if I don't, if I don't can't identify it, if I can't identify it, then I know that I'm, I'm, you know, there's no way that I can bring it down. There's no way that I can close that door. There's no way that I can bring the stronghold, break the stronghold over that, over that situation over my life. So my book identifies the patterns and cycles of the devil, because the devil got nothing new. Gotcha. So your book identifies the issue. Exactly. Which at its core, as you describe, out of the devil's cauldron is an enemy at work that we cannot see in the natural. In the natural. But is very much there in the supernatural realm. Very much active. He is on assignment to keep you broken down, beat down, broke, depressed, mm -hmm. living in fear, living in pain, diseased, and that's not God's plan for you. Absolutely not. That's never God's plan for you. There's a kingdom of darkness, but there's a kingdom of light that is here for you today that can set you free. And once the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. Put your faith in the right place. Put your hope in the right place. Submit yourself to God. You know, give yourself to the Lord. Let God set you free. Because the bottom line is that there's an enemy out there to come still, still and destroy. So I'm te I, I want people to understand that the, the, the book, it's not about me. It's never about me. Mm. The book is about, you know, the, my pastor Carter says to me, for the souls of men and the glory of God. That's, That's why I'm here for. That's, That's what God saved me for. It's good. To open up the eyes of the believer, to open up the eyes of the unbeliever. If I have to suffer for 25 years so you can get your freedom, so be it. But what are you wanting people to get from this book? What are you wanting them to understand that they can, they can apply to their life? You know, one of the things I say is the book is never mine. The, belong, the book belongs to God. I want people to know that there's a spiritual realm, that you don't have to be in the condition, in the state that you're in. This book has impacted people's lives. This book has touched people's lives, transformed people by opening people's eyes. People gotten saved to this book. People have gotten delivered from witchcraft to this book. So, so it's supernatural. It's not me. It's not about a, a man. It's about the man, Jesus Christ, gotcha. that can set you free, that can put you in a life like you said, a life of purpose. Even when you go into trials, you still got peace. Shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken. Every fragment, the pieces together. Only That's God right. can put the pieces together. So we are introducing someone saying, this is just a vehicle that God can use. They bring your life to a place of not only abundance, but a life of peace, shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken. You don't need to be uh, in, in, in a in place of entrapment where you can be in a place of freedom. Well, John, this is over 230 pages <laughs> of a revealing look at your journey of how you lived, and operated as a soldier in the devil's army. Yes. But also a roadmap of how we can as believers understand the power of the enemy, learn how to fight the enemy, Yes. learn how to identify where he is in your life and get him out for good. Amen. I know that that book will change your life and well, your life will never be the same. I believe everybody watching uh, needs to get it into their hands because okay. you're going to discover where the devil is in your life and how to get him out of your life. Are you ready for that? Uh, you may be facing all kinds of situations, all kinds of struggles, and you may have prayed, done everything you know to do, and still you're gripped. Still you've got what feels like chains of bondage in your life. Well, that might not be because you're doing anything necessarily wrong. or human, right? You might not be involved in the extremes, but there could be a stronghold. There could be something in your life that has nothing to do with your will, but everything to do with a supernatural, demonic force that is having his way. And I think that it's worth exploring. I think that the questions that you pose in the book 
help us identify what gateways there might be. The questions that you pose in the book, the diagnosis, if you will, that you give in this book might help you figure out what is really wrong. And then it walks through the steps that you can take to reach breakthrough. We've got a very special offer today. My announcer is going to tell you right now, it's a special bundle, a package that you will only find here on this show. Amen. And you will only find for the price Hallelujah. here on the show or on Amen. our website. Thank so I invite you. you. I'll be right back in a moment. We're going to pray with you here and uh, send you on your way. God bless you. I'll be right back. The devil is alive and he's busier than ever. As the day of the Lord approaches, the lion on the prowl is seeking to devour your destiny and waging war for your soul. Satan and his legion are on high alert, wielding power over governments, the economy, to blind you from the truth of the gospel, to confuse your children, afflict your body, wreak havoc in finances, your relationships, and more. If you feel held back, opportunities slipping through your grasp, if depression, addiction, negativity, hopelessness, and conflict surrounds you, then know that Satan has you dead in his sights to destroy your life. In his new book, Out of the Devil's Cauldron, A Journey from Darkness to Light, John Ramirez reveals the exact steps to take to find the devil and expel him for good. This book is not an ordinary book. All of hell wants to keep this resource from you, an inside look into the realm and a secret strategy to take your children, your spouse, your finances, your health and more, as revealed from the one-time third-ranked high priest in Satan's army. As you read through the pages of this book, discover an underworld at work against you. But watch this. The systematic steps to expel the devil from your life and how to build barriers against his attacks. Learn how to rebuild and restore what the enemy has stolen. How to recognize his schemes against you. Break the chains of the demonic force against your children. Take control of your destiny by the blood of Jesus that will purify your mind, bring peace to your life, and break the endless cycle of setbacks, pain, and destruction. This amazing book will bring you into the light, covering grace, love, and protection of the Lord for the rest of your days. But that's not all. As part of your order today, you'll receive the complete one-hour DVD where Damon walks with John through the pages of the book. Well, you saw 30 minutes today. I spent an hour with John Ramirez where we lifted the lid on what the devil's trying to do in your life. Hear the behind-the-scenes journey of how John escaped hell and through which the stronghold and grip of the enemy's power in your life will be shattered right now today. Call now to receive this powerful collection, the book Out of the Devil's Cauldron. And if you call right now, the full-length uncut behind-the-scenes DVD. This entire collection is yours today for your generous love gift of only $30. Don't delay. There are only a certain number in stock of this powerful collection, so call now. And remember, your gift towards one-on-one -on -one today helps bring breakthrough in your life and helps to allow Damon to continue to bring these powerful guests into your home and life for years to come. John, let's pray for the people that are watching. Let's pray for the stronghold that's in their life. Amen. Let us be in agreement with you that the devil has no room anymore. John, lead us in the prayer. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come together in agreement, Father God. Damon and I, Father God, we come in agreement. We're attacking the devil. We put him on notice, Father God, against the audience today, Father God, that are listening on TV in the sound of our voice. We cast out every demonic lie, every, every entrapment of the devil against their life, Father God. We break patterns and cycles, Father God. We break generational curses. We break sickness. We curse it at the root. We curse down every demonic lie, deceptions, my God. We, every demonic open door, Father God, we close it with the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray. Oppression, depression, suicide, cutting himself, Father God. We break those things right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we plead the blood of Jesus against the enemy. We rebuke the devil, the devour, my God, out of the finances of the people, of my God, out of their homes, their marriages, my God, their children, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ. My God, let people be healed today. Let people be free in their minds, Father God. Let every tormenting spirit and scorning of the mind be broken in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. John, thank you so much for being thank on the so show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, we got to know our enemy <laughs> so we know how to fight. So uh, I guess that's all I have. Um.